Okay, so let's go ahead and start our presentation. This is for chapter one. Let's go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay, so um, welcome to Textiles. Um, hopefully you read over all the introduction and welcome letters and um, emails and you are starting your chapter one PowerPoint. So uh, chapter one is all about the textile industry. So textiles, what is it? Because that might be a term that you don't know. Um, textiles touch every facet of our lives. So if you're sitting on a, an upholstered chair, that's a textile. If you're standing on a rug or a carpet, that's a textile. Um, if you used a makeup wipe to wipe your makeup off, that's a textile. So they're everywhere um, and we just don't um, think of them as textiles too often so we don't realize that we're surrounded by them. Um, it's important during ancient times because Textiles essentially um, were a big like breaking point for um, man and for different civilizations. Um, going from, let's say, something like a loincloth to a, um, an actual piece of fabric wrapped around your body, that's a big difference. So again, like it says, really important during ancient times because it was um, their way of becoming more developed. Um, we'll talk about how um, developed countries um, versus the developing countries, how textiles was a really important industry. So like it says, industries, um, the textile industry played a significant part in the development of the United States. Uh, the textile industry played a significant part of any developed country's um, uh, you know, industrial revolution, essentially. So you'll see, you know, a lot of... Um, Things that were created in textiles, maybe not now, but before, came from China. Um, we used to have a lot of stuff made in the U.S. that was a textile-related good. Um, a lot of these developed countries, some of these, you know, mega powers, um, their big boom was textiles. This textile industry, so very, very important for growth, um, country growth. Um, textiles are often used as the raw materials for other industries, so a lot of times textiles will be used in different ways um, than we would normally think. So textiles, kind of another word for something like fabric. Um, so when we think of fabric, we think of clothes, we think of maybe interior things like a couch, uh, blanket, bedding, um, but a lot of times we use textiles for other industries. So the medical industry, the medical field uses textiles a lot. Um, something like the insulation in your house, that could be made from textiles. Um, again, lots of uh, different areas where the raw material, so like not a pair of pants, but maybe the material used for pants, um, would be used in a different application. Uh, textiles is an international industry, so much so. If you are wearing an outfit right now with different components, take a look at all the different tags on your outfit and you'll see made in Sri Lanka, made in Bangladesh, made in China, made in it, what you're wearing and what you have you know, in your own household via textiles, they come from all over the place. So it is a very international industry, global on such a big scale. Um, nothing is produced in just one spot. Um, things are produced all over the place and then shipped all around the world. Okay, so textiles is big. It's a very big industry. Okay, so chapter one is called the textile industry. Um, you guys should have your textbook. Um, again, that's the um, fabric science text. It comes with, or you can buy separately, the fabric science swatch kit. So um, we'll go over that in the first Zoom on Monday, January 11th. Um, but those books are very important to have um, because the chapters, I'm going through them kind of uh, page by page. I'm summarizing it for you. But if you want more detailed information, read through every chapter. And that's why those chapter um, assignments reading are um, on the calendar. You should be reading these chapters as we go through every week. Okay, so chapter one talks all about the textile industry. Now it's broken down into three large segments. Uh, the textile industry is broken down into apparel, which makes up about, oh, sorry, which makes up about 35% of the industry. Interiors, or home goods, um, like think of the things that are around your house that are made out of fabric. That makes up again another 35%. And then industrial textiles are about 30% of the industry. So apparel and interior make up 70% of the um, textile industry. So they're very, very important. Industrial applications are important too, but we really focus on apparel, apparel and interiors. Okay, so we'll talk about those in detail. 
Okay, so we're going to break down this first chapter by what's called major textile production segments. What that means is that we're going to talk about right now um, the different um, stages of production. So production segments meaning the very first stage, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, so on. So we're going to start with fibers. And we start with fibers because fibers are the smallest component of fabric. Like it says here, they're fine and they're hair-like. So the easiest way for me to explain to you what a fiber is, is think about a cotton ball. If you've ever had a cut or you needed to take off your nail polish or whatever, you've seen a cotton ball hopefully once in your life. Think about that cotton ball. If you were to take take it in your hand and start to pull it apart, you'd be able to pull out these like little string-like fibers. And those would be the cotton fiber. So those little strings are almost like hair. That's the smallest component of any textile. So if it starts as a fiber, it's considered a textile. And that's why this industry is so humongous and so big, because so many things start out as a fiber. It's hard, you know, it's hard to imagine, you know, Gosh, there's so many. So if it starts out with the smallest component being that little hair-like strand, it's considered a textile. So we're gonna cover a lot of things in this class, but we start again right now, we're talking about the segments. And we're gonna talk about it right now in this PowerPoint, but this is also how we're gonna break down the entire class. So we're gonna start the first couple weeks talking about fibers, okay? Then we're gonna talk about yarns. Okay, so like you see there, then we're gonna talk about the construction of fabric. And we're going to talk about adding color to fabric and then so on and so forth. So we're going to break down the entire semester by the major textile production segments. Okay, so fibers are those little tiny hair-like things that make up a cotton ball. Think of that. And then we talk about yarns. So a cotton ball is not a textile product that has yarns, but imagine taking a cotton ball and spinning it in your fingers and just kind of twisting it and twisting it and twisting it you could create a yarn from your little cotton ball, now your cotton ball. So most textile materials contain yarns, but not all of them. Okay, so we'll talk about non-woven things later on. Um, we'll talk about something like felt. Felt contains fibers. It's a fabric, but it doesn't have yarns. But yarns are a really important stage. Um, yarns are continuous. It's a thread-like strand, but it's thicker. Maybe not by much, but it is thicker. Um, and it's composed of fibers that have been twisted together. So again, if you hold that cotton ball in your hand and start to spin it, um, that's that idea of making your fiber into a yarn. Okay? Then we go into fabric. So then we're going to talk about the different ways that fabric can be made. Fabric comes from yarns or it comes from fibers itself. So you don't, it doesn't have to go through the fabric stage. I mean, it doesn't have to go, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to go from the yarn stage, but it commonly does. It almost always does. So fabric can be made from yarns. It can also be made from fibers, um, but it's usually made from yarns and it's usually woven or knitted. So we'll talk about the difference between weaving into, um, yarn into fabric or knitting yarn into fabric. Um, so we'll talk about the different construction methods. Companies that make fibers are called mills. So if you have a woven fabric mill or a knitted fabric mill, um, that is the name for the big giant warehouse, the big giant fat factory where they're making fabric, where they're weaving it, knitting it, compressing it, whatever they're doing. So there's going to be different names that you're going to need to remember. A mill is one of those. A mill is the company, the place where fabric is made. Okay, not fiber, not yarn, but fabric. Okay. Then we're going to talk about once you have fabric, once you have those fibers, they're made into yarns, the yarn is then made into fabric, we're going to talk about how that fabric is colored or printed, so dyed and printing. So how color or design is applied to that fabric. And that's done in a whole different location also. That's done in what's called the dye or print house. So we'll talk about finishing houses. We'll talk about dyeing houses or printing houses. So that's again another term that you want to remember. It's not a mill. Once it leaves the mill, it then goes to a house, and at that house, something else happens, okay? So again, important concepts and important terms. Um, finishing, that's the final, final, final step in the process of textile production. So this is when additional treatments are added before the end use. Um, so an example of this would be fabric that was made out of cotton fiber, made into cotton yarn. The yarn was woven into um, fabric. That fabric was then... Uh, bleached and then 
dyed blue, and then it had white polka dots printed on it. And then the very last thing they did was put a water repellency on it because they want to use that cotton fabric for a raincoat. And you want water to repel off of your raincoat. Okay, so the finish would be that water repellency. Brushing's an example. Um, uh, sunblock, maybe they're putting UV blockers in it, so sunblock was added to maybe a bathing suit. Um, shrink, wrinkle resistance, shrink resistance, um, all of these different things. Softening, maybe they want to make it softer, it's made for a baby blanket. Um, all of these things are examples of finishes. They're not necessarily there for aesthetics, but they're there for function. It's a finish that's made to help the material act better. Okay, it's often, um, often happens um, in the same plant where it was dyed or printed. So finishing often happens in the same house where it was dyed or printed. So again, a dye house, a print house, a finishing house. Okay, so that's the name, the term for that location. And then um, we're going to talk about right now textile put up. So what this refers to is how the fabric is packaged and sold. Um, what that means is that um, this is how it's leaving essentially the mill or eventually the, the house. So traditionally one roll, and so think about like a um, uh, wrapping paper for Christmas. That, that tube on the inside, that cardboard tube on the inside, something like that is used and then they wrap fabric around it. Traditionally, they would roll 60 to 100 yards of fabric on one piece, so one round piece of cardboard, imagine that. Nowadays, to make it more efficient, more cost effective, they're making a thousand yards of fabric, rolling it on this massive, massive roll, and then they put it in a, they wrap it in plastic, they put it in a truck, that truck takes it to, let's say, let's go to Joanne's headquarters, and then Joanne's headquarters then takes that thousand roll, or your thousand yard roll, breaks it up into 250, you know, 500 uh, yards, and takes it to the west coast and the east coast, those headquarters, and then that, from that point, then they break it down into 150 yard bolts, and then it's taken to individual Joanne stores. So the way that textiles are sold is called the put up. Um, it really is quite different than the way that we are, that we're used to selling or purchasing textiles. We're used to going to Walmart or Joanne or Brightex or uh, Mood and going and looking at a, you know, a bolt of fabric, let's say not even a roll, but a bolt and saying, I'll buy two yards of that. I'll buy half a yard of that. That's not how it's sold. It's sold in a thousand yard rolls. It's sold in a hundred yard roll. Um, so the industry is a very big, scale. Um, these things are being sent to um, manufacturers like Levi's or Oshkosh Bagash or uh, Massimo. So all these different you know places where they're going to need to make a lot of uh, products. Okay so the put up is quite large in the industry. Okay now we're going to talk about where you can get fabric. So we're going to talk about primary sources of fabric, where it comes from from the from the get-go, essentially, the very first level. And then we're going to talk about secondary sources. So the primary sources of fabric, the number one, the first place you're going to get it from is the mill. We talked about this already. Mills are where fabric is made. So that obviously is going to be a primary source because that's where they're making it. So a lot of mills will sell fabric directly. Um, this happens a lot in the southeastern part of the United States. So places like Mississippi, Alabama, even Texas. Um, a lot of these places still have textile mills where they produce fabric and they sell it. Um, and so that's where um, a lot of American-made textiles will come from, from the south. Um, there are vertically integrated mills throughout the United States, and there are more overseas for sure, but we do have vertically integrated mills here. And what that means is that that, that, that mill, that big giant facility where they're making fabric, they're not only making the fabric, but they made the yarn, they made the fabric, they're going to bleach it, dye it, print it, and then they're probably going to put the finish and maybe even sew it into jeans. So a, vertical, a vertically integrated mill means that they're doing everything from yarn to the finished process. It might not mean that they're making it into an item, but they're definitely doing everything from the yarn production. They don't make the fiber, or they don't, you know, get the fibers, but they do the yarn production, and they do everything to the last finishing process. That's a vertically integrated mill. Okay, so think about it, the top of the chain all the way down to the very bottom to the last step. Okay, so those are common in the U.S. 
Um, you can also get um, fabric from a converter. So if you get fabric from a converter, that's considered a primary source because what a converter does is they buy something that's called a gray good. Great good is an important term that will come up on your exams. It's something that we'll talk about a lot. What a gray good is, is it's an unfinished fabric. A gray good is a fabric that hasn't been dyed, it hasn't been bleached, it hasn't been finished, there's no prints on it. It's essentially like muslin. If you've ever purchased muslin at the store, it's just like a very beigey, simple material that you buy for really cheap. You can get it for like a dollar a yard. And it's great to just play with it. You can use it. I love to have it on hand all the time just to do so many things with it because it's, it's kind of like the paper of fabric. It's just something that you can sketch on, um, you can cut stuff out, mock it up, do a little sample, and it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. It's going to cost you a dollar or a couple bucks. Um, so a great good is an unfinished fabric. Now it's an unfinished fabric of any sort. So if you have uh, like an unfinished taffeta, if you had an unfinished brocade, if you had an unfinished, you know, if you had any of these types of fabric, it's not a very, it's not a specific type of fabric, but it's any fabric that is unfinished. It's not printed, not bleached, not dyed, not, there's no finishing on it, nothing. Okay, so it's, it's a kind of like a bland, vanilla, cardboardy type of fabric. Okay, so the converter is a person that buys unfinished fabric from a mill, so directly from a mill. So the mill made it, the mill hasn't done anything but produce it. Let's say it's cotton. They just took it, they made cotton fabric, and then the converter buys it. The converter then has it dyed and finished or printed however it wants, and then it sells it. Okay, so the converter takes raw material, makes it into fabric, and it's already physical fabric, but makes it into like colored fabric or, you know, design fabric or finished fabric, water resistant or whatever. So the converter takes that raw material, that raw fabric, unfinished fabric, has it dyed, has it finished, has it printed by another company and then sells it. So that means that they own the rights to it. So they're the ones who are selling it. They're not selling it for the mill. They purchased it. It's their fabric now. They're going to do stuff to it and they're going to sell it. So that's considered a primary source. Okay, converting boring material into their material. Okay, importers are considered a primary source. Um, so an importer means somebody who brings fabric in. Now we can have a direct importer or import mills. So we'll talk about the kind of difference between those. A direct importer is somebody who buys fabric or other textile products like, like it says here, like luggage or a handbag or an umbrella or pants. So a direct importer buys fabric or a product from a foreign mill and brings it to the United States. Because they're bringing it here, so since that importer went out and purchased the fabric or purchased the item, brought it to the United States, it's now theirs. It's their product or their fabric, and they're going to sell it here in the United States. That's a direct importer. Okay, so they're bringing things in, they're selling it under their name or under their whatever, their trademark. There are also import mills. Um, these are foreign companies that make fabric or yarn, um, and then they export to the United States. So they are sending their fabric or yarn here to the United States. Um, and then, again, that, that's where, how we buy it as a consumer. These operate similar, similarly to an American mill. So a lot of what happens domestically or around the world, um, it all happens kind of the same. It's all the same process. But it's, again, you are, if you're getting material from an import mill, so for, from a foreign company who sends it to the United States, you know, maybe that import mill, maybe they didn't, you know, maybe they didn't make it into jeans or, but you're buying the fabric from that foreign company or that yarn from a foreign company in the United States, that's still considered a direct source, okay, from that import mill, okay, somebody from overseas. Um, a secondary source of fabric would be something that we would come into contact with as just a person, as just a consumer, um, not necessarily somebody in the industry. Um, even if you, let's say you have, a, like you have a small brand, let's say you have an Etsy shop and you make, um, you know, like cute little handbags or something. Um, you may be buying large quantities of fabric um, wholesale maybe from somebody like a jobber, um, but you're not getting it, I mean, unless you're doing this on a large scale, you're not getting it from the you know, first source. You're not getting this from the primary source. You're probably getting that material as a wholesale price from a secondary source of fabric. 
So a jobber, a retail store, an overseas agent, these are all examples of the secondary source of fabric. They bought it from somebody and now they're selling it to you. So it goes through two people. It's kind of a middleman if you want to think of it that way. Um, a jobber is a person who goes out to different mills, um, a domestic or import, um, and they buy from those mills, they buy from that converter, they buy from people, um, and then they sell it under their own name. So they buy usually overruns and discontinued fabrics. Um, what overruns are is if they make too much material. And so let's say they buy from a mill in China that made a bunch of um, denim. And that denim was supposed to go to Levi's. And Levi's bought it, but they made too much. They made a thousand yards too many. And Levi said, I didn't order that. I'm not taking it. So a jobber could go in and say, okay, I'll buy that thousand yards for a cheaper price. Um, and then they can sell that to different houses, to tailors, to upholsters. They can keep it technically and make something out of it, you know. So that's what an overrun is. Discontinued fabrics means, you know, just like it sounds, fabrics that aren't being purchased anymore or made anymore. So if it's something maybe that's really trendy, like a print that isn't popular anymore, you can purchase that as a jobber and then sell it at a more discounted rate. So like it says, they sell to small design houses, tailors, and reupholsterers. Um, a retail store is an example of a secondary source. Again, that, that, that like kind of scenario that I just kind of went through of Joanne, where they buy the fabric from a vertically integrated mill, let's say. Um, they get it. They get it. They break down that gigantic thousand-yard uh, roll. They break it into bolts, and then break it down more, and break it down more, and then send it to all the Joanne stores around the United States. And then we, as a consumer, can go in and say, I want half a yard of that. That's an example of a secondary source. It's not coming from the maker. It's coming from a middleman. Okay? And that's why it's expensive. When you buy something at retail price, it's, it's pricey because it had to go through a bunch of different people. It had to be shipped. We'll talk about how the textile industry is a very, um, a very bad industry for the environment because of the crazy amount of shipment and shipping that happens in the textile industry. Um, there's some great videos below this in the uh, module under chapter one videos. Um, really good videos that kind of talk about, man, textiles go all over the place. So it's a really bad industry for the environment because of the shipping that happens and all of the imports and exports. Uh, speaking of that, overseas agents. So if you were to get fabric from an overseas agent, um, this person represents the importer or exporter of the country where it's doing business. Um, but it's not essentially, it's not the, the primary source. So it's not, uh, this was now, this overseas agent is representing the mill or is representing the company or is representing the purchasing. Um, so again, another middleman there. This person's taking some money. This person's not doing their job for free, so it's going to cost you more. So these secondary sources of fabric, um, these are going to be more expensive because, again, there are more people in the line. There's that middle person. Okay. Here's a really great example of how you can see that, like vertical, how a vertically integrated mill would work. Starting with fiber production, they do yarn. You know, they make the yarn. They they have the mill where they make the fabric, where they weave it or knit it. Um, they send it to an independent converter, maybe, or they are the converter, so they decide what you know how they're gonna dye it, or color it, or print it, or whatever. Then it goes to the production. Uh, manufacturing. So then it goes to, okay, so this is the vertically integrated mill area, then they sell it to um, Ashley Furniture Store, and they make it into a couch, and then, you know, or a jobber, or, you know, directly to the retailer, so on and so forth. So it has to go through a bunch of different stages, and these are those segments, those production segments that we're talking about. Fiber production, you know, this could happen, fiber production could mean a giant field of cotton, that's fiber production. This could mean a really big facility where they're making polyester fiber, a really stinky facility where everything's melting. So fiber production is the first stage. And they send it to yarn and textile. And then again, it goes through these different people. And if you have more middlemen in here, if you have an independent converter and then a production and then wholesale and then retailer, all this, this is going to cost you more money. Okay? So... This is, we, we have to kind of keep this in mind. And this is why we say vertically, vertically integrated, when someone takes over a bunch of the different steps. This comes directly from the text. Okay, 
Um, let's just talk about a little bit about what domestic and import means. It, it sounds like what it is. It is 100% what you think it is, but I'm just going to break it down a little bit just to be a little more helpful. So domestic, that includes any production segment such as fiber production, yarn production, fabric production, dyeing, printing, finishing, anything, retailers, anything that happens here in the United States. We break down this industry, again, like I said, it's a global industry, and we talk about things domestically or imported. If it happens here, it's domestic. If it happens somewhere else, it's an import, okay? Any, it says, and any non-production segments, which include trade publications like a magazine. If anybody knows what WWD is, Women's Wear Daily. Vogue magazine, that's something that's really important for textiles. That's a trade publication. Um, textile testing services, so a laboratory that tests the stability and the strength of a specific type of denim, let's say. If it's happening here in the United States, that is a domestic textile testing facility, okay, or service. That happens here, domestic. Trend forecasting services, um, color services like Pantone. If that, if their headquarters is here, if that is happening here, they're a domestic company. A lot of places have domestic and import. So when it comes to textiles, there are a lot of companies that work 100% globally. They've got a headquarters here, let's say in New York or LA, and then they also have headquarters in Milan, and then they have one in China, they have one in Bangladesh, all over the place. Because the, again, this is such a global industry. Import is the opposite of domestic. It's a major source of apparel for the United States because we don't produce a whole lot of apparel here anymore. Yes, like I said before, we do still produce fibers. We still do have some mills in the South, but we don't produce a lot of apparel. We don't, that's a textile that we don't make a whole lot of. Like again, we make fabric, but we don't make the apparel. We may take our fabric, ship it overseas to China, to Sri Lanka, to Bangladesh, to Vietnam, to all these other countries where they're going to make it into a dress, into shorts, into jeans. Sorry, that's my little dog. He is 15 years old. Um, you'll hear him in my videos often. I apologize. He's old and he has a bad cough. Um, and you'll also hear him pitter-pattering around the house. He has pretty short nails, but he's got little funny pads, so he always makes little uh, sounds when he walks. You may also hear my children in these, so I apologize for that also. Uh, my son's in class, and we do Zooms at the same time. So, again, import is anything that comes from overseas. Um, we get a lot of our apparel imported. Less than half of the apparel and fabrics used are made in the United States, and right now, way less than half. So it's a big chunk of uh, apparel that's coming from overseas. Check your labels, like I said, made in Taiwan, made in China, Korea, India, Colombia, Brazil, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, all over the place. All over. Okay, we get stuff from all over the world. Why? Why do we do that? Production in low-wage countries is very cheap compared to production that would happen in the United States. We make, what, I think $12 is our minimum wage right now? I'm not exactly sure. That's a lot. Um, I'll show you a chart later on the semester, but the day wage for someone making apparel in a country like Pakistan is 28 cents a day. It's a very big difference. So you have to think, what would the price tag look like if we made everything here? It would be much more expensive. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So we have to realize that as a consumer, it's very important that we understand um, where things are coming from um, and what we're purchasing and how it was produced. So again, reason for import, it would be produced much cheaper. Um, sometimes it's a superior quality. So not just, not just sent somewhere because it's cheaper, but sent somewhere because it's better. So Scottish wool, Japanese silk, French and Italian leather. Oh my goodness, that stuff, you can't make it that way here. We don't have the capabilities. We don't have the hundreds and hundreds of years of practice. If you want Italian leather, you need to go get Italian leather. We can't make it like that here. It's like butter. So sometimes it's for the superior quality. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about buying and selling fabrics, selling fabrics. Um, again, this entire chapter is all about the textile industry. So we're not going to get into nitty gritty yet about fibers and yarns and all that. We're talking about the industry as a whole. We talk about primary sources of fabric. What are those places called where they make it? What are the places called where they then finish it? Who are the people that 
you know, or the in between the middlemen. What are they? What are they called? These are all possibilities for careers in the textile industry. So we go over this because, although it might seem kind of boring and eh, okay, it just kind of sounds like business. Um, it's really an important business, and it's a business that has hundreds of thousands of different job titles. So if you, if you know, if you end up loving textiles, um, you may want to get into this industry. So the textile industry, knowing a little bit of the background of it is very important. So buying and selling fabric. Um, there are two different ways, two primary ways where fabrics purchased. So you can buy fabric according to what's called a written specification. We call that a spec sheet or a sample. Now, I'll ask you later on in the semester. We'll have different um, assignments and we'll talk about this quite a bit. Um, this is something that um, all design students also, like the sewing students, they have to kind of comprehend. When you are buying or selling fabric, you can do it again in one of two ways. You can do a written specification, which is a lengthy document. So maybe it's a, a, a manila folder with 100 pages in it, 30 pages, 75 pages. So this written specification that tells you exactly how you want that fabric to look and feel. That means that they are going to write on that paper the exact fiber content, the exact yarn, the exact width of the fabric, the weight, the thickness, the breaking strength, the color fastness, the finishes, etc., etc. So it's really, really important. I'm going to let my dog outside. Sorry, hold on. Yeah. on at the back door. Um, it's really important that with these written specification that the person who is making the fabric makes it exactly like it says on the written specification sheet or within that document. That means that if I am buying, I am the purchaser, I am buying a thousand yards of denim. I like denim. I'll use it all the time because we all know what denim looks like. It's got an indigo blue color. You can sometimes see these like white yarns that come out of it. Um, we all know jeans. They're made out of denim, typically. So I say that I want a company, I want a mill to make me fabric that is exactly, you know, 60 inches wide. I want it to have white you know, threads going one way, yarns going one way, blue yarns going the other way. I want them to be, you know, this thick. I want it to be this strong. I want it to hold up when wet, blah, blah, blah. If I get that fabric, they make the thousand yards for me. They send it to me. I look at the fabric and I say, ooh, you know what? You put the white yarns the wrong way. I asked for the white yarns to be going this way and the blue yarns to be going that way. And you messed up. So I'm going to send back that thousand yards of fabric and you're going to make it for me again. So it's important that if you're buying or selling, especially fabric based off of a specification, off of a spec sheet, that you do it exactly the same. That's different from a sample, because if it's a sample, I say, oh, I'm at the store, or I, I'm, I love these jeans, I'm going to take a sample of this material, chop it off the jean, I'm going to send that to the manufacturer, and I say, I want the fabric to be just like this. And the producer must make it as close to it as possible. So it must be almost identical to the sample. The sample is a representation of what the buyer will later receive. So if, in reality, the sample that I gave them was 100% cotton, but what they gave me back was 90% cotton, 10%, oh, I don't know, linen, let's say. Let's say something else that's natural. Um, that's okay, because it was pretty much identical, and it didn't make a huge difference to, like, the aesthetics of it or the way that it worked. And it was pretty much the same. But maybe it was a little bit cheaper to use a little bit of linen, so they did that instead, or flax, they added that in. Okay, so the difference between a spec and a sample is vastly different. You need to get exactly what you ask for with a written specification, and you're going to get something really, really close to the sample. Okay, now let's talk about private labels. Private labels are something that we come into contact with all the time and we just don't realize it. So these are retail brands. So Target, Target has a million private labels. They've got like the Rosen Bud, I think it's called. They've got Massimo. They've got... Um, auxiliary or exhilaration or whatever it is. They've got a ton. Macy's has INC. Kohl's has Vera Wang and Laura Con, Lauren Conrad. Um, a private label is a retail brand. Um, apparel or other sewn products like a handbag or umbrella or hat or backpack. 
Um, so apparel and other sewn products are manufactured specifically for a retailer. So Lauren Conran has clothing, handbags, hats, all that kind of stuff specifically made for Kohl's, so for the retailer Kohl's, and it's sold exclusively by Kohl's. That's a private label made for that, you know, larger company, and only that larger company can sell it. Okay? Like it says, this is a rapidly growing part of the textile industry. These are very, very common. Sorry, closing the door. So, again, we come into contact with these all the time. We just don't realize that that's what it is. So, private label, again, you go to Target, even Walmart. Um, you go into a place like Macy's, Nordstrom's. Uh, Kohl's, a lot of private labels. Something like Levi's is not a private label unless it's a Levi, you know, oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of Levi's uh, private label for Target. Levi's does sell a type of jean just for Target, and I can't remember what the, what the name is. But Levi's are sold all over the place. They're sold at Kohl's. They're sold at Macy's. They're sold at Nordstrom's. They're sold at the Levi's store. They're sold at Target, all over the place. Um, so that's not an example of a private label. If they have a Levi's, let's say, uh, Go, you know, let's say it's a Levi's and the, and the brand is Go, and that's only sold at Target, that would be considered a private label, okay, the private label of Levi's. Okay, so um, very, very rapidly growing. A lot of companies sell private labels um, because it makes it feel like it's, you know, more special. Specific, it makes it feel more expensive, better quality, and sometimes it's not. So it just, like I said, it's a growing part of the industry. Um, there are extensive facilities with state of the art design and workrooms. So a lot of these private labels, you know, they do have um, better machinery, better um, production. So sometimes they are more expensive. A lot of times they are more expensive than the just, you know, the house labels. So they're going to be more expensive than just. Walmart brand or Target brand or, you know, if Macy's had just Macy's brand, um, it would just be a little bit more expensive because of these, you know, better facilities and better production. Um, a major part of these sales involve import goods. So a lot of this, uh, a lot of what's being sold as a private label is imported and then it's stamped with that label. So then they can sell it as a private label. Um, retailers maintain offices and staffs overseas, um, again, because a lot of stuff is being imported. Okay, market and production planning. Um, so what we're talking about here is we're talking about the stuff that happens before. So before it goes into production, before there's an article about it in you know, WWD, you need to plan for that. So each segment of the industry, apparel, interior, and industry, um, each segment of the industry must plan well ahead of time for the next selling season. So they don't just start making something in January to sell in February. That's not how it works. There's a lot of planning that goes into this. Um, I work in photography, and so when we sell a product, we sell, you know, we, we photograph that product that's going to hit the stores eight months in advance. And that's just for the photography, but that's not for the production of it. So this happens far in advance. Uh, many operations must be performed before finished fabric is actually made. They need to plan for a ton of different things. A lot of stuff has to happen before, you know, the finished fabric is actually completely, completely made um, and after it goes through all those processes. So the design of woven fabric for apparel, so let's say the design for jeans or denim, you know, denim for woven jeans, which is an apparel product. That usually happens one and a half to two years before the designs will appear on the rack. So just producing, just making that special denim for those jeans, that planning happens a year and a half to two years before you'll ever see it at the store. So again, this, there's a lot of planning that happens. New fabrics are shown at what are called fabric trade shows. Um, Delta, we used to take students to trade shows, and that was so much fun. We used to take students to Magic, Project, um, and Pool in Las Vegas. Um, and these are really large trade shows um, that happen, I mean, depending on what the industry is, um, two to four times a year. And then at these events, uh, people are able to purchase fabric um, in advance. They're able to see it fresh off of, you know, off the spec sheet and then they can buy the product or the apparel um, or the good um, 
and then have it ready for the new season. They're going to be the first ones to have this type of jean, or the first one to have this type of dress, or whatever it may be. Um, there are different seasons. So talking about seasons, um, there are different seasons for the different parts of the industry. So for apparel, the retail selling seasons include spring, or sorry, fall, spring, summer, and holiday. So when you go to the store to buy clothes, if you're, you know, if it's starting to get a little cool out, let's say it's October, you're going to want a cute, poofy, sleeved sweater that's long and oversized and maybe it has a pumpkin on it. That's going to be your fall apparel. And that's a season. You wouldn't buy that in summertime. You wouldn't buy that during, um, you know, spring. That's apparel made for fall, purchased in fall or sold in fall. Springtime, that's when you're going to get your pretty floral dresses and you know, for guys, you're going to be buying your maybe your, your Bermuda shorts, or your cargo shorts, or um, you're going to be buying your lightweight, you know, jackets during this time. For summer, this is when you're going to be buying your bathing suits. This is when you're going to get your trunks. This is when you're getting your bikini. Holiday, this is when you're going to be buying those beautiful coats, your, 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 your evening dresses, your cocktail dresses, all different seasons. So we <clears throat> sell apparel during four different selling seasons. Fall, spring, summer, and holiday. That's different than interiors. So remember, interiors is a different part of the industry. Interior furnishings sell in two seasons. So they sell in the fall and the spring. Because although, yeah, you may buy yourself like a decorative uh, Christmas pillow, or you may buy yourself some cute like throw blankets for Halloween or, you know, for the fall, that's not a very, um, you know, it's not going to be a big purchase. Where your couch you know, you're going to keep that couch and you're going to keep it for a while. Your drapes, um, your upholstered fabrics, your rugs. So yes, we do sell different seasons 100%. You may get curtains for spring and then curtains for, you know, the cooler seasons, fall or winter. You may purchase, you know, blankets or bedding, especially bedding. You might buy those flannel sheets in the fall, so you can use it in the fall and the winter. And then you switch to just your 100% cotton in the spring and the summer. Okay, so interior only has two selling seasons, fall and spring. We kind of, we skip the holiday and um, winter. Furniture, fabric, and floor coverings, that has one season. So like I said, the couch. You're not going to buy a couch in the fall and then switch it out in the spring. You're going to keep it. You're going to keep it all year round. You're going to keep it for years on end. Um, your chairs and your kitchen, if they're upholstered, let's say, you're not going to trade them out all the time. But, you know, you might buy a new one in a couple of years. So there's one season for fabric. Um, furniture and then floor coverings um, and that one happens in spring or September I'm sorry September is a big month for the textile and the fashion industry so if you've ever maybe got a magazine in September and you're like why is it so big September is the month for new stuff it's the month for new apparel it's the month for new interiors. It's the month for new furniture. It's the new month. So the that September issue of Vogue is, you know, 400 pages because that's when everything new is coming out. September is a big selling season. Okay, big selling month. Industrial fabrics, they're not seasonal. They're not changing. They're essentially the same all the time. There are differences, but they're not going to, like, market that. Industrial fabrics, like let's say fabrics for the lining under um, upholstery in your vehicle, um, stuff to make surgical masks, uh, stuff to make um, a lab coat, that type of stuff, it's just kind of the same all the time. And then differences aren't going to be marketed. Okay, so this is an important one, textiles and the environment. I'll talk about it briefly because it's uh, mentioned in the chapter one, but I will continue to talk about textiles and the environment for the entire semester. So you'll hear me talking about um, how certain aspects of the industry impact the environment all the time. And the reason why I do that is because it's really, really important. Um, many environmental problems relate to the textile industry. Things like air and water pollution, waste disposal, workers' health. These are things that are issues in the textile industry. So, air and water pollution. Why? How? What do you mean? How? How's that possible? Well, we can say air and water pollution from, first of all, just the shipping. So, again, let's talk about cotton. It's grown in the United States. That takes up a ton of water. So, first of all, boom. One thing, then. There are tons of water. Not necessarily pollution, but the usage. So, tons of water used to grow the cotton in the United States. Again, it's put on a barge and it's, you know, shipped across the oceans to China, let's say. So it's got to go and it's going to 
All of that is going to pollute the waters and the ears as it moves along and is transferred to China. Then it's made into fabric in China, and then they ship it from China, they put it in an airplane, and that airplane flies to flies that fabric now to Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, they dye it and they print it because it's what they do. They do a really good job at, let's say, batik or something, and they do that print on it, and then they ship it back to China where China puts a finish on it. All that air pollution, all that water pollution. Not to mention that in Sri Lanka, they dyed it there. And then they had all this chemical dye that they just decided to dump. They didn't recycle it. They didn't clean it. They just dumped it. So then now there's water pollution. Okay. Then again, then it's shipped back to China. It's cut into uh, the shape of pants or shape of a dress maybe, and it's made into something. Now where are all those cut pieces going? Is it being recycled or is it just being dumped? So then waste disposal is a big thing for product and for water. Um, workers' health. Maybe in these facilities, because they're overseas and they're not being regulated like we would in the United States, maybe these workers are working around really strong chemicals, really bad fumes, and they're breathing it in all day, every day, with no ventilators, no masks, really poor ventilation in the buildings, so the health of the workers is not good. So again, the textile industry is not very good for the environment or for people. Um, lots of issues. So again, I'll go through this chapter by chapter, how the uh, industry affects the environment um, or the, you know, society. Um, but the industry takes many steps to reduce these hazards, um, especially when it's a domestic company. So um, one of the videos that you'll see, again, right below this, um, is a really good video on um, how a company is trying to become more sustainable. Um, uh, Okay, Tech is a company that makes textiles that you can find at, um, you'll find them at Kohl's, you can find them at Target. It's so funny, you can find it everywhere now. And it's one of those um, brands where they definitely are putting money into their name and into their brand and their trademark. Because I see it on my bath towels, I see it on my bedding, I see it on the recycled jeans, you know, that I bought, the recycled material that are made into jeans. So it's a good company and it's, it does a really good job in that video of talking about, um, the textiles and the environment and how companies are changing and how companies are really trying to reduce um, the different hazards. So cleaning and filtering out water and fumes, so air filters in these facilities so that the air that exits the facility is not contaminated. Um, water filtration, cleaning out the chemical you know, dye bath and reusing it. So reusing that water, cleaning out the chemicals, putting the chemicals to use again, recycling, reuse of chemicals. Um, monitoring of noise levels and air quality. So that's something that we don't think about as noise, but there's a great video, there's a, there was a, there used to be a great um, documentary on Netflix called Maquiladoras, and I don't think it's on there anymore, but if you can find it, it's about a textile facility, a textile um, mill in Mexico, um, where it was so noisy that they said that they never heard birds anymore but they used to hear birds all the time. They used to have this beautiful stream that would run through the town and there were no longer birds chirping and the stream was now green, just rotten green gunk um, and all because of the textile mill that was there. So again, companies and brands and corporations are trying to change this, but because we're such a global industry, it is hard to keep track of it. I'll go over more of this in detail as we go through the class. Um, there's a good video down here, so if you want to go ahead and click on this link here, it'll take you to a cool video about Levi's waterless jeans. Um, there's a similar video below in the um, supplemental videos, but it's different, so if you want to click on this, this will take you to a really cool video that talks about the way that Levi's is doing this new waterless jean. Um, so again, um, this is an older uh, stat, so far more um, gallons of water have been saved. Um, but um, gosh, I think a year ago when I put this on the slide, 4.5 million bathtubs worth of water had been saved, uh, 770 million water bottles, 3 billion glasses, drinking water for almost 900,000 people, for almost a million people for an entire year. And this was literally Levi's way of doing exactly, producing exactly the same product, but with less water. So this is a really cool initiative that Levi's has put um, together. And again, you may even see this on your jeans that you have. 
um, because this, is, this started a few years ago. So it's becoming very popular and it's getting picked up by other companies. So this is an important thing to know that um, uh, these companies that are the uh, groundbreakers for environmental change, if it's a popular company like Levi, if it's a popular company like, you know, someone from Target or Macy's or um, Forever 21, if they start it, that's how it becomes trendy. And it's very important that we as consumers understand these changes and how they're very important. So it's great when a company like Levi's does something like this to make a you know a big push to do better for the environment. Um, recycling is a way that the textile industry can save so much waste. So the waste of one company often becomes the raw material for another. So soda bottles and polyester fabrics are melted and used to produce new yarns. There's some great videos again in the supplemental video section please take the time to watch them because if this doesn't make sense to you with me just talking through videos or talking through slides, the videos show you and you can actually see them taking a water bottle, everything from the outside label to the cap still on, and how they turn that into a new jacket, into an umbrella, into a couch, into whatever. So it's nice to watch those videos because they show you the processes, okay? So again, soda bottles and polyester fabrics being reused. Um, plastic soft drink containers are melted and used to make fibers for uh, carpets. Um, Target is really good. I love Target just because it's, you know, got everything a mom could need. But Target's really good about having brands like the B brand for children's toys. Um, they're awesome because they use recycled plastic for everything. They use recycled materials for everything. So the cute little teepee that you have in your kid's room made out of old water bottles. All of the clothes, all of the stuffed animals, the dolls, the plastic made for that little piano. All of that was something else before. And instead of it becoming waste and sitting in a landfill, it is getting turned and they turned into and used in a different way. So re recycling is very, very important for um, the, you know, the lifespan of a textile. Um, gin waste, so a cotton gin, the waste, just like the cotton that falls on the floor, let's say, or is on the side of the machine, or not the stuff that is going you know, into yarns and going into fabric, but all of the gin waste, the stuff on the side um, from cotton processing is used to produce novelty yarns. So they use it to make special types of yarns that have a special look to them. Okay, so recycling is important. Um, available landfill space is limited and costs are high. Uh, me and my family watched that movie Idiocracy recently. Good morning. Oh, go ahead. Jack's over there. Um, and their big thing is landfills. Landfills are filling up to the brim because people don't realize that there's only so much space. That's a real thing. Landfill space is limited. It's expensive to keep garbage. Um, therefore, recycling of non-hazardous waste is essential. Um, I heard a really great article one time or a new segment about a garbage barge off of the coast of New Jersey having to float all the way down to Florida, back up to Jersey, then across the ocean to China, then back and forth. This barge was in limbo. It was a massive landfill barge just full of garbage and there was a bedpan and that's considered hazardous waste and somebody saw it at the facility in Florida where it was supposed to be dumped and they said we're not taking that there's hazardous waste on it nope you gotta send it somewhere else and they stamped that contains hazardous waste material on that barge and nobody would take it so it literally stayed in limbo for a very long time that's a real life thing garbage just doesn't disappear it has to go somewhere and it has to sit somewhere. It's taking up space. It's taking up resources. And that's why recycling is so important. Super important for textiles because you can recycle so many aspects of textiles. Okay. So an increased awareness on the part of the consumer on you and me and everybody will create consumer demand on a market for these products. Again, if you realize that, oh, that B brand at Target has that cute piano and it's made 100% out of recycled plastic, Maybe I'll buy that piano instead of the other piano, which is just made out of brand new plastic. So you just have to, you know, be um, uh, educated consumer. It makes a very big difference for everything that you're purchasing. Okay. Um, Raw for the Oceans is another example of a brand where they're trying to do better for the environment. So they have something that's called a bionic yarn. 
and these are high performance textiles from plastic recycled from the oceans around the world. The fabrics themselves are made from a blend of cotton and newly recycled plastic fibers. So you get kind of all the great benefits of all the different types of fibers. Um, waste in plastic and garbage in the ocean outweighs fish, har fish harvesting three to one per pound, which is crazy. One of the good things, I know it sounds crazy, but one of the good things about the whole you know, pandemic, um, the oceans are seeing kind of this new rebirth where we don't have as many ships moving back and forth. We don't have as many people near the coastlines dumping. Um, so I know it sounds crazy, but there are some you know blessings in disguise with all this that's happening. So the oceans are actually seeing um, kind of this, this refreshing uh, season um, because normally the oceans are packed with garbage and waste and chemicals. Um, it's very, very, very saddening. So to date, and again, this is older, it's about a year old, so I have to update this, uh, bionic yarns have removed at least 10 tons of plastic, probably closer to 20 tons of plastic for just this project alone, just this one single brand of clothing. Uh, Patagonia. Patagonia is another company where they're really trying to do good for the environment. They have something called Warmware, which is a place for their customers to bring in stuff that they already own. So whether that be a wetsuit or a jacket or a shirt or whatever it is, they repair it, hand it down, or recycle it if necessary. So it's a really cool initiative that Patagonia has um, to reuse textiles, to keep them going, to make the lifespan longer, not to just Oh, your Patagonia jacket got torn or if it got bleached or whatever, you can't use it anymore. Instead of throwing it away, this worn wear initiative takes that jacket and does something else to it, gives it new life. Um, they've also developed these wetsuits. This is an example here of um, their Nor Norwex. Um, it's a new type of a wetsuit not made out of neoprene, and it is a um, high quality wetsuit made out of plants. Um, and other uh, companies are starting to, other competitors are starting to make fabric similarly. So this is a great video here. It's from the New York Times, so you can't find it on YouTube, so just copy and paste this. Watch this video. There's a similar one in our um, module, um, but this is a great, uh, again, initiative for the environment to stop using that neoprene, which is essentially just a fossil fuel. It takes a lot of work to get it. It's very dangerous. It's very bad for the environment. And then, you know, how long does your wetsuit last? Um, wetsuits, though, that are made out of neoprene are really strong. But that, again, is the reason why these wetsuits are so great. They're of, you know, comparable quality, but made out of this plant. So, you know, lots of companies are, you know, trying to do better. Um, fair trade is a movement that affects the textile industry, and it's something that is becoming very popular, which is great. So if you see something that has a fair trade stamp on it, you'll, it's normally like a circle with the, the shape of a silhouette of a person on it. Um, if you see that stamp, that approval on it, that means that these products were made without labor exploitation. So no child labor, no slave labor, people were paid, and it wasn't done, you know, for free. They use environmentally sustainable practices, so the environment was kept in mind when these things were being produced. Producers receive fair prices, so they're being paid fair prices for their products. And it especially refers to developing countries who sell to companies in developed countries like us in the United States. Okay, so it's really important if we're purchasing stuff from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, from India, from China, not even China, but um, you know, from all these other developing countries. China is developed, but from the developing countries, we're buying stuff from them. We want to make sure that it has that fair trade stamp because we want to know that those people were taken care of, that the way that the environment was treated was correct. Okay, it mostly affects agricultural products like coffee and fruit and sugar and flowers and a lot of what you see, what you have in your refrigerator or in your pantry, but it's becoming very popular in the textile industry. So cotton apparel has already been completely certified in Europe. So anything that comes from Europe um, that's, that's a cotton apparel product, so very specifically cotton and apparel, um, has to be fair trade. So that's awesome that Europe, you know, is doing this. Patagonia, another again, this Patagonia, most people know that it's a very expensive brand, but it's expensive because they don't want you to buy a new jacket every season. They expect you to buy the jacket and use it for a long time. They make it really high quality so that you can use it for a long time. They're not the Forever 21. They're not selling you a jacket for 
you know, 20, 1999, they're selling you a jacket for $500, but they expect it to last a lifetime. And then if it doesn't, they have those initiatives in place where you can recycle it or have it turned into something else. Okay. They also, Patagonia also does this fair trade initiative, a nonprofit organization, Fair Trade USA, works to improve the lives of farmers and factory workers around the world with trade, not aid. So they're not giving these people handouts. They're just treating them correctly. So fair compensation for their labor, safe working conditions, safeguards against child labor, making sure that the environment is in, you know, in mind. So this is very important. And again, Patagonia is a great company. Um, they keep a lot of environmental and social um, aspects in mind when they're producing um, all of their goods. Okay. So again, we go through, this is a very quick review of the industry. There's so much to talk about. Please read chapter one in the textbook because it goes into detail with everything. Um, the textile industry is one of the largest and most diverse business segments. It's efficient, it's modern, and it's truly global. We haven't gone over all those things. The textile industry combines art, engineering, technical styling, marketing, business, photography, uh, uh, you know, uh, publication, everything to produce the correct aesthetic, performance properties, and value. Okay, so all of these things work together to make these final products, these end, end products that we so, so commonly use. Uh, many careers in textiles do not have the visibility of like a designer. So we know Vera Wang is for Kohl's because we know who Vera Wang is. She was a designer. She's a designer. Um, we know that designer name. But below her are thousands upon thousands thousands of people making those products available at your local store okay so tons of careers within this industry again not all are super visible so many people are unaware that they even exist um, students might be concerned with the large number of textiles and related products that are being important and yes a lot of things happen overseas but there's still a lot that happens here. So there's a growing volume of imports and exports within the industry. So we are producing certain things here and exporting them out. We are importing in, so there needs to be that import agent. There needs to be that middleman that deals with all of the imports. So there are still a ton of career options within just that field. Um, foreign textile corporations have facilities here in the U.S. So even though it may be um, like Zara is a, um, is a uh, European company, and but... You know, there's a Zara headquarters here now. There's a Zara's corporation here, facility here. Um, retailer private label programs are increasing. So again, that might be something that's produced overseas, but they've got the private label headquarters here, or so on and so forth. Um, there's a need for textile savvy people within the import sector. What did you say? Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. Um, so there um, is a great need for people who are savvy to the new technology, you are savvy to all of the things that are textile related. Okay, so if you, again, if you enjoy this class, you may want to consider um, looking for a career in the textile industry. I have a nice list here of the different positions and specialties, like a textile converter, we talked about that already, someone who buys a great good and then transforms it into what they want. The textile designer or colorist, Someone who, you know, designs the look of the textile or chooses the colors for it. Um, Pantone is a wonderful um, colorist company. And they deal with everything related to interiors and apparel. Um, color and trend forecasting, again, just like Pantone. Um, museum curators or um, anybody, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so a museum curator um, would be a great example of someone who would need to have textile knowledge because of the way that we work with textiles that are old. So it's very important that when you're handling older garments, older textiles, that you're, you know, very careful. So you would need to be savvy. You would need to have textile knowledge to um, enter that career. Environmental protection, textile research, textile production, specification writers, coordinators for sales and design, a PR Someone who works in public relation or advertising, sales, domestic and or import, sourcing specialist, so on and so forth. There are so many career options in textiles. Um, it's definitely a field where um, if, again, if you like this class and it's something that you um, think that you would enjoy, uh, getting a degree in textiles um, is a good idea because there is a need for people in the industry. Okay, so that's it for chapter one.